Hi, I'm George. I work at Apple. I'm a contributor to the Clang Static Analyzer. And today I'd like to give you a talk about two new improvements in the Clang Static Analyzer. And the talk is structured into three parts. In the first part, I'd like to tell you what the Clang Static Analyzer is, roughly how it works and why do you really want to use it. In the second part, I'll talk about using the coverage-based iteration order in order to get better reports from the analyzer. And in the last part, Artyom will talk about improved C++ support, in particular for constructors and destructors. And let's start with an introduction to the Clang Static Analyzer. The Clang Static Analyzer is a great tool to find all kinds of different bugs uh, at program statically at compile time without actually running the program. And those could be high value security, potentially critical bugs such as use after free, or sometimes just crashing bugs like uh, null pointed reference or memory leaks or many other kinds of bugs. And when the Clang Static Analyzer finds a bug, the way it presents it to the user is by generating reports. Uh, I'm not sure could it be seen on the projector at this resolution? Okay. But, but by basically generating a report which visualizes a pass to the bug to the user so that the engineer can take a look at that and hopefully see the original issue and fix the bug. Uh, the analyzer is embedded inside a few IDEs, but even if you're not using one of those, uh, we also ship a tool called ScanBuild, which just wraps your build system invocation and generates those uh, static HTML reports. And for more details on how to use uh, the Clang Static Analyzer and more details on scan build, you can uh, go to the web page uh, present on the slide. And to see now how the Clang Static Analyzer actually works, is basically it simulates a program execution. So it runs uh, what is called symbolic execution, which is exploring the path through the program, but unlike the concrete execution, which uses symbols, the, oh, sorry, unlike the concrete execution, which actually has values, uh, the analyzer instead uses symbols uh, to explore the program. And whenever such exploration hits an error, uh, the report is generated and presented to the user. And now for a short example of how it all fits together. So there is this uh, very simple four-line program where we take a parameter and return uh, 1 over x, depending on the branch chain. Uh, the analyzer starts by generating a control flow graph. So that's actually a Clang control, fl control flow graph which has Clang AST nodes inside. Uh, so each node in that has a Clang AST uh, node inside. And is the control flow graph shows all possible paths uh, through that function. And then a so-called exploded graph is generated which uh, basically shows how the analyzer explores uh, this control flow graph. So in this example, it starts with setting x to zero, and then branching on A follows. So first we explore the branch where uh, A is non-zero, so then x is set to one, and we return one, and everything is good. And then the second branch is exp explored. In that branch, A is zero, so x remains zero, we have to return one over zero, which is a bug, and therefore the report is generated. And with that short introduction, uh, I'm going to talk about the first contribution, which is using a coverage-based iteration order. And the motivation for this contribution, which you probably have uh, seen if you looked at many Clang Static Analyzer reports, uh, is having uh, very long, very hard to comprehend uh, reports. And the common theme amongst such reports as this one was uh, needless looping around a certain loop start. And by manual inspection, we have seen that it was actually possible to go to the box straight away, and there was no need to go around the loops three times first. And to see what's going on here, Oh, sorry. Uh, so this problem was uh, quite ubiquitous on uh, some code bases, most notably XNU, which is a Devon kernel, and we've seen many paths which were uh, very incomprehensible. And by manual inspection, we have seen that it was possible to actually just find the bug on first iteration. And 
this work was started with an aim to provide shorter and more concise diagnostics. And to see what's going on, I'll need a second bit of background, which is how the analyzer actually generates uh, the exploded graph, an example of which I have shown. Uh, so the analyzer uses a worklist uh, algorithm, which is basically a simple uh, classical worklist algorithm where we'll start at the start node at the start of the program, and while worklist is not empty, we take uh, one item out, then we generate the successors of a node. So the successors is simply uh, simulating the execution of a single uh, statement and seeing uh, what states could we possibly end up with, end up with after uh, generating, uh, after simulating the execution of the statement. And then the successor states are re-added back to the worklist. And the worklist algorithm itself uh, doesn't specify in which order it is explored. And previously, the analyzer was simply using a devs first search uh, iteration order. And now, to see what the devs first search iteration order does, uh, I'm going to step through this simple example where we have a loop and a simple branch inside the loop. So here we start at the head of the loop. We hit the branch. Uh, we first explore the first case where uh, the value of the branch is true which brings us back to the start of the loop. Then again, we hit a uh, branching point. Again, we explore in a death first search fashion the first child first. And that actually brings us back, uh, brings us to the end of the program. But we still have items in the work list. We haven't explored all possible paths yet. So we, uh, in a first in last out fashion, we explore the last uh, node we have. And that actually lets us find the bug. So here we have found this uh, path, and we see that if the program goes along that path, uh, uh, division by zero happens. Uh, but actually what's notable here is we did not need to go through the loop twice in order to get there. It was actually possible to get there on a first iteration. So something is not quite right here. We are wasting effort uh, in order to generate that bug report. And that's, of course, a very simplified picture. In reality, the analyzer is much more complicated and has a lot of uh, heuristics which interplay in a complicated way. Uh, so to start with, the analyzer has a deduplication feature and which states that if the same report is found multiple times, uh, the shortest one is returned. So on the previous example, uh, the user will actually see the shortest report as expected because uh, eventually the shorter report will be found and this will be the one returned to the user. Uh, the analyzer also has a feature of having a fixed uh, budget per source location which states that the location will not be visited more than a fixed amount of times. And that would mean that in a previous example, even if the analyzer would not know uh, when does the loop terminate, it would still return the short expected example to the user uh, because uh, the exploration will be dropped after uh, a certain location would be visited more than three times. And we also have a budget for a number of inlinings, which adds to the complexity of the interplay between those heuristics. But basically, the bottom line for uh, those budgets is that uh, for many cases, analyzer works uh, just, as, just as expected and the shortest pass is returned. But for quite a few unfortunate cases, uh, those budgets are not quite enough uh, and the shortest pass uh, is not found at all. And now to talk about the solution to the problem. Uh, so in order to solve that, I have decided to use a coverage-based iteration order, which is uh, very similar to how coverage got its father's work. And that basically records the number of times the analyzer visits each location and then uses a priority queue, which prefers uh, source locations which we have, which we visited last times before. And that allows the analyzer to find bugs on first iteration whenever possible. So if we revisit the running example with a coverage-based iteration order, again, we start at the start of the loop, we hit the branching point, uh, but now something different happens. Instead of uh, going back, 
uh, to the start of the loop. This node is now deprioritized because we've been there before, and instead we just uh, can go straight to the error node and find the bug yeah, and without needlessly going around. And uh, now I would like to talk about results. Uh, so this is a histogram showing the 95 percentile of pass lands. So an X and U that shows a huge decrease uh, in that percentile of uh, pass lands of a bug, which means that bug reports are much easier to understand. And on many other projects, the uh, decrease is not that huge, but it's still quite noticeable and the user experience uh, gets noticeably better. And what we have found is not only uh, the user reports got better after we have enabled this feature, but we were also able to find much more bugs, which can be seen in this uh, diagram here. So that actually happens because the analyzer has a fixed budget of how many nodes it can explore before uh, the exploration stops. And by using a coverage uh, guided iteration order, we were able to utilize that budget much more effectively and that leads to a 16% uh, average increase in number of reports found. And that's uh, all for the iteration order. And now my colleague Artyom will talk about improved C++ support. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Artyom and I guess let's jump into constructors and destructors. Uh, static analyzer was uh, having false positives in C++ uh, like for a long time, uh, specifically because uh, in many cases for many kinds of objects, static analyzer was not able to evaluate constructors and destructors even if source code for them was available and uh, static analyzer therefore could not uh, understand the, problem, the program and uh, it was producing incorrect uh, reports and additionally uh, static analyzer had problems uh, with temporary objects specifically. Uh, th there are special operations that uh, it needs to do with uh, only with temporary objects but you don't want to know about them. Uh, so uh, this essentially uh, not three different problems, that's one big problem and uh, it's actually uh, very challenging. Uh, so let me explain real quick why it's challenging. So. Uh, Constructor call is kind of like method call, but not quite. Uh, uh, we already knew how to evaluate method calls, but uh, when we are calling a constructor, a certain amount of invisible bookkeeping needs to be done. And uh, this is actually uh, the hard part uh, of the problem. Uh, so uh, let's uh, talk about very basic stuff uh, on how essentially initialization happens. Uh, so even if we are like, in, like suppose we are in C, uh, even if we have like a structure and we're initializing with something complex like a function call, uh, Clang syntax tree produced for uh, this uh, variable declaration would be uh, very simple. Uh, it literally says that we're declaring a variable and initializing it with a, a result of the function call. And static analyzer would uh, do exactly that. It would uh, first uh, evaluate the function. Uh, obtain uh, the return value which is going to represent contents of the structure and then uh, as a next step it would put uh, these contents into the structure, into the variable. Uh, now let's see what happens in C++. Uh, in C++ the only way to initialize uh, an object is to call a constructor. Let's take a look at this simple code that just calls a default constructor for a variable. Uh, surprisingly Clang syntax tree is going to be exactly the same, uh, like instead of call expression, we're gonna have construct expression, but even the type of the expression is the same. Uh, but uh, the meaning of this syntax tree is completely different. And if we try to evaluate it like we did in C, uh, we will uh, fail uh, for a million reasons. Uh, so let's actually try to do this. Uh, First of all, uh, we're going to try to evaluate the constructor. Uh, in order to evaluate the constructor, we need to uh, use something as this. Uh, it is the object that we are constructing, and that's, of course, uh, the variable uh, p. Uh, but uh, the problem here is that we only learn about variable p on step two. Uh, and on step one, we just don't know that it even exists, so we cannot uh, pass it into the constructor. 
And uh, the problem here is that construct expressions are not uh, self-contained in Clang. Uh, they uh, explain what constructor is called and uh, on what type of object, but uh, not what object is constructed. Instead, uh, information on what object is constructed is uh, derived essentially from the context in which construction, construct expression appears in the AST, like from parent statements of the constructor. Uh, so if we only uh, evaluated these uh, statements in the opposite order, it would have made much more sense. Uh, we, could f we could have first uh, uh, realized that there is a variable allocated and then uh, call the constructor on that variable. Uh, that's the right thing to do in C++. Uh, so uh, the bottom line here is uh, there is an important form of bookkeeping, uh, namely, when calling the constructor, we need to make a certain effort to figure out what objects we are constructing. We are seeing this object for the first time. Uh, this needs to be like computed, like a symbolic value in static analyzer, and uh, construct expression uh, is not self-contained. It does not help us uh, evaluate uh, what object is constructed. Okay, so. That was uh, just a variable. Uh, it was just one syntax pattern. Uh, in fact, uh, there are a few more syntax patterns that we need to support. And not only uh, we need to support these patterns, but also uh, it's only getting worse as new versions of C++ standard are getting released. Uh, there, like, there are more and more ways of constructing the object uh, appearing in C++ regularly. Like, I mean, uh, it's not getting worse. I mean, of course, it's getting better because uh, C++ is improving and we all love C++ and we all uh, love many ways of doing the same thing. But uh, Static Analyzer uh, needs to keep up with all these changes. And actually, all of these uh, examples would require separate uh, code path in the Static Analyzer in order to uh, evaluate them. Uh, so, uh, we tried to support construct expressions. Uh, we thought uh, we had one problem. Uh, now we try to uh, support them. Now we have 30 different problems. Uh, all of these uh, examples need to be addressed separately, and uh, in all of them, uh, construct expression appears in a different context, and uh, we need to support construct expressions together with context. Okay, so is there anything uh, in common uh, between these examples, like like literally anything in common. Like how many contexts do we actually need? Maybe we need like infinite uh, amount of different contexts or maybe it's finite. Uh, so yes, there's uh, a little bit of something in common uh, about these examples uh, when it comes to how Static Analyzer needs to handle them. And uh, the rough idea here is that somewhere outside of the construct expression, but pretty close to it, uh, there are going to be something uh, like a statement or something like that uh, that's going to uh, represent uh, the storage of the objects that we're constructing. Uh, it's going to uh, like make the address of the object actually uh, appear uh, in the program uh, for the first time from the point of view of this syntax tree. And Static Analyzer needs to have a look at that statement and probably a few other statements in order to first uh, figure out what object is constructed and then uh, keep in mind what object it just constructed uh, so that uh, post-construction bookkeeping uh, could be performed. Okay, so that's uh, essentially the only thing that we needed in Static Analyzer, but we need to uh, make sure this is what happens for all these different cases. And because uh, construct expression and this uh, storage statement are pretty close to each other, uh, we have actually a very limited uh, number of different contexts uh, that we need to support. And uh, I was tempted to pretty much uh, enumerate all of them and introduce a uh, data structure in Clang called construction context uh, that uh, essentially captures the context in which construct expression appears. Uh, so currently a construction context 
can be obtained by looking uh, at the Clang source level CFG. Uh, that is by looking uh, at constructor call uh, elements within CFG. Uh, so for every constructor, you, you have the context. So staking laser while looking at the constructor uh, already knows the context. Uh, it does not need to like look ahead. You cannot look ahead in a work list. A static analyzer processes things statement by statement. Uh, and uh, construction context uh, helps static analyzer with all uh, these questions that static analyzer previously didn't know how to answer, like how to construct an object, uh, how to call a destructor if it's a temporary or uh, like materialize a temporary, whatever it means, or like uh, elide the constructor entirely, maybe uh, if it's elidable. And on the other hand, construction context uh, is not a single class, it's a hierarchy of uh, currently 15 classes, uh, and every subclass of construction context represents a certain way of uh, constructing an object in C. And uh, Construction contexts are very easy to define when like uh, new versions of C++ are released. We just capture a couple of parent statements and that's all we need to do to define a construction context. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it is a very good abstraction uh, layer between uh, your tool and the complexity of C++. You can pretty much uh, use it uh, if only your tool already uses Clang CFG. So uh, with the help of construction context, uh, we have improved uh, our C++ support from this many cases to uh, that many cases in a few man months. And uh, essentially this huge problem of uh, supporting constructors and destructors and temporaries was decomposed into uh, like 30 small problems that uh, a single person uh, can comprehend any single one of them. Uh, Actually, if you uh, are interested in helping me support uh, the remaining cases, I would gladly work with you. Uh, I'm not monopolizing this work. Uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, help, help me. I'll be happy to work with you, uh, do code reviews, whatever. And uh, by uh, doing all this stuff, uh, uh, the primary result was uh, that we pretty much uh, cut uh, false positives in half uh, on a project known as WebKit, which is a popular browser engine. It's a huge C++ code base. And then uh, after we fixed a couple more bugs in Static Analyzer, uh, Static Analyzer was finally usable on WebKit and uh, useful uh, to WebKit developers. They were actually finding uh, useful uh, bugs in their code. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about C++. Uh, if you have uh, questions to George about how we find more bugs and uh, uh, no longer produce scary bug reports, or to me about C++, uh, we are uh, happy to answer. Okay. There is a mic in the, in the mid, and this is going around. So if you raise your hand, go to the mid. Uh, I have a question about the coverage base iterator order. Uh, so, uh, did you do any analysis on false positives or false negatives? Because if you don't iterate, iterate through all the loop, you're not looking at array acts. And it could potentially create a false negative on a buffer overflow or something. Um, okay, so firstly, uh, the static analyzer is not a verification tool, so we don't have any promises on that we'll find all the bugs. Uh, in general, like I don't have hard numbers, but as an overall estimate, the false positive rate actually goes down because the longer the pass, uh, the more likely it is to be a false positive uh, as the probability of something goes going wrong uh, grows exponentially, essentially with the length of the pass. Like, if something can go wrong at one statement, now you have that probability for like every uh, single statement in, in the past you have explored. Uh, yes, in, in general it went down, but I don't have hard numbers. Uh, and one of the reasons why I don't have hard numbers is it 
sort of impossible to figure out whether it was a true or false positive when you have such a gigantic uh, report. Okay, thanks. So the reports that were removed uh, were not very useful anyway. Are you able to give any comparison with the kind of bugs or the approach that CLI takes uh, when it's uh, the, the static analyzer uh, with uh, LLVM code? Um, uh, do you have any, anything to say about that one? Okay. Yeah, okay, oh, sorry, do you want to? Okay, so okay. Firstly, I have no idea how CLI works, George probably knows better. Okay, so yeah, CLI takes uh, quite a different approach. So firstly, it operates on the LVM bytecode, so like that bypasses this problem, for instance, for C++ entirely. Uh, and secondly, I think it can actually generate, it doesn't generate a report, I think what it can generate is actually a contraexample, which with any luck you can actually run. Uh, so those two are very nice features. The feature which is not that nice is because it operates on the LVM bytecodes. Uh, a lot of information is lost at that point and it's uh, sometimes either really hard or not possible to, to write a lot of checkers which we do have. So it's, it's, it's a, a trade-off. It'd be interesting to see if you could manually sync up the ones found in Clang and the ones found in Klee and see and see if they were an intersecting or union of sets uh, so that you'd have some idea what you were missing. But uh, um, yeah. yeah, I'm not A sure work, <laughs> it would be possible because of different checkers which we run. So yeah, I don't know. So yeah, I th I've heard uh, a few things about uh, efforts to compare a different, uh, at least static analysis tools to each other and see how much they miss. Uh, I guess we can talk about that later. All right, that's it. Thank you.